All right, welcome. Um, OpenNFE, Open Platform for Network Function Virtualization. What a word, right? Should be the foundation for running your virtual network functions. And what we'll do today is really a brief overview of what OpenNFE is, what OpenNFE has delivered so far, and where we're heading to some extent. So um, really high level, easy, DZ for perfect for lunchtime. So let me start off with a, a sentence from Toby Ford that he brought to the, the community in September 2016 when we ran a small FIDO summit um, over in Austin. And, um, well, he said, well, most of the componentry that we had is already developed. What the 21st century is really about is piecing the overall thing together. So we have wheels, we have engines, we have seats, but we don't really have proper cars, especially when it comes to NFV. So rather than spending more time on building componentry, guys, go integrate, piece things together so that I can use it. And I'm not using it in a way like, here's a set of tools and toys and whatever, go piece it together yourself, but build something that I can use as simple as I can use a car or a television today, as opposed to I've got to go and invent, my, invent myself. So what I want as a developer is, if I'm thinking NFV, I'm thinking of, I want something that I want to go deliver as a service, like a virtual or a cloud VPN service. Um, I have a, a workflow in mind to do that. I have something that I want to go develop against. What I don't want is figure out how to wire the thing up, what technology to use to wire the things up, what individual IP addresses to do, how to kind of really translate the app intent into how the network is set up, what components are going to be used, and so forth. If I'm developing at the level of Cloud Foundry, I don't want to really dive down and, and fiddle around with a configuration of a single firewall or configure IP tables and the likes. That's not what I want. So everything like service lifecycle management, virtual machine, machine lifecycle management, piecing the thing together, all the network I.O. questions, in theory, it should all be hidden from you. That's the desire. That's also the desire that Toby expressed by saying, Guys, somebody needs to go and build it for us. If we look at the open source building blocks that we had like two, three years ago, we were still kind of limited. We had a virtual machine manager, OpenStack. We had a network controller, Open Daylight, base operating system. And we had, well, predominantly one option for a virtual forwarder, which was Open vSwitch. Open vSwitch was developed for cloud applications, not with performance in mind, but with just plain functionality in mind. The thing shifts 60,000 packets on a single core. 60,000 packets on a single core for networking? Come on, right? Um, so things had to be improved. Things did improve if you look at the componentry. By now, we have an open source analytics subsystem. You can look at Panda on, on one of the DevNet booths. Um, there is orchestration projects that spun up like crazy. There is OpenO. Open source Mano, um, AT&T contributed with Ecomb, an entire open source orchestration system for virtual machines. There is new VM management systems. There is a raft of additional controllers. And there is, especially at the networking layer, a hell of innovation happening around containers. But first and foremost, Cisco, around about a year ago, together with a, partner, a couple of partner companies, created an open source project called fastdata.io, FD.io, or FIDO. Um, that gave us a new forwarder, which is the vector packet processor, which shifts packets, well, up to something like 14, 14, 14 million packets per second. Not in the kilobits range anymore, like with OVS, but in the multi-million packets range per second. And scales across large Mac entry tables, large routing tables. So a million packets with that speed, not a problem. Uh, or a million routes with that s uh, speed, not a problem. But it's still like, this is the bag of componentry that you're presented with if you want to go and build a solution stack. Who does that? Who builds that for you? Yeah, you can go to vendor A and say, oh yeah, vendor A says, oh, I have a nicely integrated silo stack and it runs my VNFs. Everybody else says, uh, I'm not sure. 
or you can go to vendor B and again, same answer, right? And what we've been busy integrating even and as vendors is we've taken component tree and we integrated the stack and then OpenStack moves on with a new release every six months. Open Daylight moves on with a new release every six months and we start it over and over and over again. Is that useful for an industry to go build the same thing over and over and over again? No, let's do it once and do it together in the industry because it just gives us a base layer. We need to build the, f the equivalent of what Linux gives us for a router, a router or for networking, i.e. base operating environment for VMs and piece it together. Somebody needs to go piece it together so that you don't need to go care what is below the red line. So you need to go compose the thing. You need to go and make it deployable in an automated way. You need to test it and test drive it in a continuous way because whenever OpenStack moves or Open Daylight moves, you want to make sure that nothing broke. So you need to go and continuously test the thing as opposed to one point in time. And then, well, eventually you'll find out that certain things don't work and, well, start over or change certain component trees so that NFE actually performs better on such a virtualized environment than it does today. So one key thing was obviously upgrading the virtual forwarder to something that is really capable, but there was all kinds of little tweaks that you need from an orchestration management, lifecycle management perspective that still need to be enhanced. So we formed a project to do systems integration as an open community effort. So OPNFE doesn't create, it integrates. And yeah, that does a little bit of creation as much as a systems integrator does creation. So it's, it's composing the car and then polishing it. The polishing we do, but we're not building yet another engine. We're not building yet another steering wheel. So if you look at the entire picture, we, we have a, a bit of an odd animal by now. It's the first open source effort or community effort that really does systems integration. Very different from many of the other projects here or different than any other of the other projects here. All of these guys are code producing animals. We are an integration animal in OPNFE. So if there's one thing that I want you to take away, it's systems integration as an open community effort. That's what OPNFE does. And let's now go and ask ourselves a couple of questions that OPNFE had to answer. So there is all these choices, right? Which controller do I choose? Do you think that an open source project can make a choice? Choosing means politics. And politics is the natural enemy of code. Whenever you want to go get something done, politics gets into your way. So you can choose to say, OK, I'm only doing this and then argue forever. Or you can say, let's do we guys, we want to do this with this set of componentry. We want to do this. Let's just do it and then start a race. We build one car, you build one car, and let the market figure out. There's a magnitude of cars. Not everybody wants one car, right? Otherwise, everybody would just write one drive, one, one single car. We're not that way. We're human beings. We like diversity. So you can go and compose, if you have a set of Lego blocks, maybe a house or a Millennium Falcon, it's really up to you. Let's go and compose it the way we want it. So these scenarios, i.e. compositions of components, that's the main release vehicle, what OPNFE does. So we're not building one stack. By now, we're building up to 50 different stacks. From a customer perspective, yeah, you say, uh, which one to choose? You're going to go and try. See whether you like it, because not every single feature is available in every single stack. So based on what you have in there, you're going to go make a choice. And ultimately, the market will decide, because merit will win over time. Merit will win, not the politicians. So the second thing is, well, a scenario is really a composition. It's a car. Does it really work? We need to go and test drive it. So we need to go deploy it in an automated way so that we can repeat that thing rather than piece it together manually. And we need to test it in an automated way so that we can, whenever a component moves, we can push it through the system over and over and over again to understand whether the little thing that moved broke my entire setup. Well, and as soon as you're ready, you're not ready, you start over. Because as soon as you're ready, you'll find out that 
any of these components already moved. So we have to build the overall thing as an iterative process. All of these individual steps, when we created OPNFE in the first six months, we had to go and build and create so that the process and machinery is there. And eventually, you're figuring out that certain Lego blocks, like the bended Lego blocks, don't exist yet. So you have a feature that you require, like, for instance, fault diagnostics and monitoring, big empty void in the overall VM space. So understand whether something works or not. Yes, you can look at the VM. OpenStack tells you the VM is alive, it runs. You can ping it. Does that mean that the firewall works if you can ping it? Is a router alive if you can ping it? No, exactly. So, but OpenStack says alive. Maybe you need to go drill down a little bit further from a diagnostics perspective that you can do that. That's one project in OpenStack that, that does that. Also, from a HA perspective, if you randomly choose uh, routers or, or VNFs that you want to go shoot, do you think that the system will still be operational or not? You don't know, right? So all these things, fault diagnostic, fault isolation, OPNIV spends a load of time trying to go and tackle these problems, fix them, so that you can have better diagnosis, better understanding of what really happens in the system. So we need to eventually create components. What we've done day one, and we first released things in June 2015, so a year and a half ago. First release was Arno. We follow a river scheme with kind of alphabetical order. So the first river that we've chosen was Arno. And we came up with something that is relatively basic. We put the carpet into the room. What we've done initially is, well, we had to go and, from a componentry perspective, we had to choose something for compute, for storage, for networking control, basic infra, basic operation, so that you have a portal there. You need to have something that allowed you to install the thing and then test the thing. What we've chosen is mostly OpenStack components in the networking area. We've chosen OVS as a forwarder. Slow, yeah, but was available that time. We've chosen Open Daylight as a controller. But again, then the typical uh, components that you find in OpenStack, like RabbitMQ, Corusync, and the like. So we run OpenStack out of the box, swing a network controller underneath. That was the main starting point. And then run a couple of tests against, or ran a couple of tests against that. Even these early days, people started to argue how to install the thing. So even though we wanted to just get started and have base infrastructure up so that we can create this iterative process, so that we could create the pipeline, people already started to argue. And there were people that were favoring fuel as an installer from Arantis. There were other people that were favoring uh, the Red Hat flavor of installation. And those days, it was Foreman and Quickstack. Rather than argue forever, we said, let's, let's allow the two options. Let's build it twice, see Ultimately, you want to go and deploy a similar system, and you want to go and deploy that similar system now with two different flavors. That was two scenarios day one. Now, we wanted to go and another thing is we wanted to run the overall system for real. You know that the, the biggest job can, uh, jo uh, joke in OpenStack is it runs on DevStack, which typically means it runs on a contained virtual environment on your laptop. Does that mean anything for NFV, whether you can get real performance, whether it really runs? No, right? So it, it's, it's fine from a development perspective, but from a de real deployment perspective, it's a joke. So we didn't want to go and sign up for that joke, which is why we said we have to run on bare metal day one, and we run, have to run with HA day one. And that led us to a minimal configuration for OpenFV with six servers. One is a jump post just to install the installer and, and feed everything into the system. Then OpenStack requires at least three servers for HA to run on. So that's four now. And then in order to have a meaningful network setup where you can at least have packets leaving a box and entering a second box, we said minimal configuration needs to be two compute nodes. That's a total of six nodes. Six nodes as the minimal setup not cheap, right, if you do that. But 
that was the minimal starting point that we defined for ourselves, and we bought initially equipment into the Linux Foundation, into a Linux Foundation reference lab to go and run these setups for us. So we have a reference lab that we test things again in a continuous way now. Over time, members stood up and said, well, Intel stood up, I'm going to go donate a lab. They donated multiple labs. Huawei stood up, donated a lab. Ericsson stood up, donated a lab, and so forth. So now, by now, we have a variety of infrastructure worldwide so that it's not only the UCS lab, the, 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 the Linux Foundation lab that runs UCSB, but you have Intel servers, you have Huawei gear, you have Ericsson gear, so we can even test things on a magnitude of different server infrastructure worldwide. But that was the initial setup that we used. Next step, Brahmaputra. If you worry about that one, that's a, a river in India. Um, so we have quite some influence from Asia, as you notice, um, when we've chosen the name. We already bumped up the number of, of scenarios, and that was released in March, so around about a year ago. We already bumped up the, the number of scenarios that we're supporting. So we added two more installers, Compa Compass, that was something that, that Huawei provided, and Canonical, an installer based on Juju Charms. And we added more scenarios. Initially, it was just we are using open daylight networking just for layer 2 setup. So it was just a tunnel, VXLAN tunnel manager. We introduced L3 capability with open daylight. So to provision not only L2, but also L3. And we brought in specific solutions for BGP VBN setup so that you can reach out and hook up to a BGP domain. If you have a, a networking domain that's been set up by OpenStack, you can well, propagate routes in and outside the domain by hooking up BGP that, that way. Um, and there was additional network controllers introduced. So Onos came in, and the Juniper guys were pushing open control in. Again, we're not making choices. We allow the whole thing to go in, into a race of what's getting adopted, what's not getting adopted. Um, if people want to do the work, they will do the work. If they don't want to do the work, they don't want to do the work. So if certain cases like you find here, you wonder why there is no open control with fuel, well, they weren't interested in doing the work. Doesn't make, mean that the scenario might not make sense. It's just like nobody did the work. Work follows interest. Well, Colorado, Next step up was in September 2016. So now we're kind of half, away, uh, half a year ago, and that's the last release that we've done. And we introduced a bunch of additional things. So we went from initially two scenarios to more than 20 scenarios in Brahmaputra to 37 scenarios. So we're growing the complexity that we're dealing with, which is good, because it eventually means that there's something in there that you might be interested in or trying to find out whether does this work and would this work as well? Uh, I'm not sure, but let's look at this shiny car. So we're by 37 scenarios and we added not only ARM support, so not only x86 as an architecture, but also ARM. And we introduced that the, was the first trace of FIDO VPP, so this very fast forwarder being introduced into a release. Um, so it's the first time that you re were really able to run VNF or VNFs, virtual network functions for real. Uh, that's a high level representation of how this overall thing looks. Um, so we are not, we're, we're trying to go and show this thing as a kind of a, an infographic that we're doing integration, testing and new features across, well, a variety of components. But I don't like that graph too much. One key thing is that we're not testing things on a single app. So you could say, well, it's been validated on UCSB in the Linux Foundation lab. It's an open lab. The community runs it. Everybody has access to that. Yeah, but if it runs on Cisco, do you think it's straightforward that it runs on a super micro-based lab or a Contron-based server lab? I can tell you it's not. And there's nitty-gritty things that we found, like interface ordering matters. Interface naming matters. Some of these installers are, they believe I have five interfaces in the system. You give them six, whoo, blow up. So there's all kinds of things that you don't think of day one that you'll discover by moving from one setup to another setup. Sometimes even simple things like, yeah, well, VLANs, 
I just picked VLANs from a different range and the thing didn't, didn't expect it to be picked from that range. So loads of things that are hard-coded or things that the developer didn't think of to make it flexible enough all fall apart when you're moving from one lab to another lab. Let performance alone, right? So that, that's not even the thing there. So by now we have I think something in the order of 11 or 12 different labs worldwide that we can schedule jobs on. And that's awesome because who here has, well, a variety of 10 different servers, server architectures and the like that you can go and run on? Probably nobody unless you have really deep pockets. So if you run stuff in OPNFV, or if you introduce your scenarios and help us or join the community, get your scenarios into OPNFE, you have an opportunity to run on a variety of hardware, probably a bigger variety than you would ever have. So if you're building cars, it might be attractive to join the community, not only as a consumer. So we have two types of consumers here now. The developers that want to go and test drive the stuff and integrate, but also the guys who may be just interested in the shiny car or the latest car. So from a testing perspective, we are running stuff that you would naturally run in dedicated upstream projects. So we're running smoke testing from OpenStack, like the Tempest test suites. We're running smoke testing from Open Daylight, the ODL test suite, or smoke testing from Onos. There is a couple of specific tests that OPNIV developed, as simple as I bring up two VMs, can they ping each other? Can I ping from the outside world over SSH? You will be amazed how many of these answers initially are answered with no. Even can I just access the APIs of OpenStack without even executing the APIs? In many cases, the answer is, if you're starting to integrate day one, the answer is no. So these things are kind of iteratively in complexity, right? The first thing is a health check on can I ping the APIs or can I get to the APIs? Then I run something like vping SSH and ping user data between two nodes. And then I start more complex uh, uh, processes all the way up to bring up an IMS system with 10 different VMs to check whether a real application could run on that system. Obviously, if I fail here, then I'm going to go stop, right? So I'm, there's no point in trying something really sophisticated if I, if I fail early on. And there is a couple of projects in OPNFV that created their own test suite. So there is a resource reservation proje uh, project, there is a fault management project, and they came up with specific test cases to go and test the functionality that they created in the overall stack. That's natural, right? So that you have specific functionality tested with specific test suites. And the more stuff we bring in, the more diverse these test cases will be. Well, and then we have a test results dashboard. Um, so from a release perspective, we will only release stuff that has four consecutive runs with, well, all shiny, all good, because otherwise we're not going to go call something release ready. Four is a kind of arbitrary number that we picked. We felt like two is not enough, three is maybe good enough, and then add one more. This is how I, we arrived at four. And um, so far it's been okay, because getting four consecutive runs that don't fail is usually a good indicator that you've done a decent job at integrating. It's, it's not a proof point that it doesn't fail forever. Um, there is a project called Yardstick, which is even going a little bit further, because many people say, well, how does OPNFV relate to Etsy? At a high level, Etsy provides an architecture, an architecture blueprint. Do we follow the architecture blueprint really one by one? Not really, because nobody can follow our Etsy architecture, because the, the way the Etsy architecture is built doesn't really translate to one to one into open source building blocks. So many of the APIs that, are, that Etsy defines, we can't build, because, well, the component tree isn't built that way. Still, Etsy defines in TST001 a bunch of test cases, high-level test cases, that we can adopt. And Yardstick is a framework that tried to go and allow you to define infrastructure, say what VNFs you want to go run, select the test cases, execute them, collect the results. And it implemented a set of test cases that were defined in TST001. So we are trying to at least lean on what Etsy defines from a test capability perspective and test definition perspective so that 
well, whatever these guys from an architecture come up with, we can see, well, how well is it reflected in reality? And again, comes with a dashboard, but more importantly, I think this is kind of a, a high-level summary of what is typically being tested. Nothing fancy, right? So basic things like what is the access latency to memory in a particular setup? Because you're, you're suddenly deploying a system as, a point, as opposed to you're testing a single component, and that's very different. What is the overall latency of individual network component trees talking to each other? And we're taking that to the next level, and that's something that we're showing at the demo booth here at, right across at D08, where we're taking entire solution stacks under test with a tool called NFV Bench, and Cisco's about to open source that tool, which is black box testing of a full stack. Because again, if you're testing an engine, do you test an engine in a car in isolation? No, you test the engine while it's integrated into a car. Will the engine perform as well as it performs if you test drive it individually? Probably not, because it's got the surrounding of the car. But as a customer, are you interested in how much horsepower the thing has on a test stand? No. You have interest in how well the engine performs if it's integrated into the car. So I think end of the day, you want to go test the system as opposed to test an individual component and test the system as a black box. That's what Yardstick tries, and we're taking it one step further with NFV Bench. So all of this is meaningless if you don't do that as an iterative process. So unless you run the overall thing on Jenkins, so a JAP scheduler, in an ongoing way, whenever you're done, you start over, you have proven nothing. So we define the system, we integrate it, build it. So out of the component tree, the installers will piece it together, we'll deploy it on a couple of reference labs, we will gather the results from the testing, and then we eventually start over. And we do this for all the scenarios in an ongoing way. So all these systems are loaded, 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 and we're all struggling for resource. So if you have a bunch of servers at home that you don't need, give them to us. Because we always have more scenarios that we want to go run, more things that we want to go try out. And we're trying these things out on a kind of regular daily basis. Every 24 hours, we'll start over. I think by now, and we're probably in the area of we've, we've done north of 6,000 OpenStack deployments. There's very few people who've done that many OpenStack deployments on the planet. Just because, well, and we're growing because we're doing a couple of additional OpenStack deployments every night on a variety of infrastructure worldwide. That's not everything, right? So all these things we found that, uh, yeah, well, there's people that said VNFs, routers, switches, that's almost a real-time operating environment. But if I run a real-time operating environment on a hypervisor, what does that mean? I'm running something that is real-time on a, well, naturally shared operating environment that gives me a time slice, and that time slice is almost random. So I'm running something that is desired to be real-time on non-real-time. That's a problem. So the KVM for NFV guys looked at saying, well, what can we do in order to optimize NF, uh, KVM to give it better real-time capabilities? So that's something that people look into. We're looking into a couple of policy areas. So an orchestration. So what can, be, what can be done? Just recently, I think there's been a bunch of manual projects stood up. But a management and orchestration solution, again, as a point solution, it needs to be integrated. So there's people looking into integrating OpenO, OpenBaton as orchestra as a project. <clears throat> we ourselves were the very focus on kind of shifting packets. I started a project called Fast Data Stacks, FDS, and we again have that on demo here, where we integrated OpenStack, OpenDaylight, with this fast forwarder, VPP FIDO, in order to unlock the potential of real NFV with past packet forwarding, as opposed to, yeah, you, you can run it, but it runs like a toy because it can only do 60,000 uh, 60, packets a second. So we've been enhancing the stack across the board, which is great, right? Because you have a variety of people 
for their expertise looking into a variety of areas. So in one example is, for instance, Doctor, which is a fault management project, which came up with patches to OpenStack to give us more visibility to, oh, compute is down, or it can force a service to be down. All these things, these APIs didn't exist prior in OpenStack. We provided them, they got integrated into Liberty, and from now on, they're shipping. So we've done certain tweaks to OpenStack, Open Daylight Component Tree, for instance, we had to enhance big time for fast data stacks to give uh, it new capabilities from a group-based policy perspective to talk to a new class of different switches and render us. So we continue to enhance the capabilities or service function chaining, another nice example, where it's a native project in Open Daylight, but in order to test drive it, we had to go and create additional test suites in OPNFV to really test it at system level. So again, whenever you have a component project somewhere, you probably find a systems integration project in OPNFV to also kind of test these capabilities at system level and not at component level. So if we do these things, there is one thing that we typically notice. So you have an upstream community that we need to work with. Open Daylight, FIDO, OpenStack. We need to con contribute things to their guys, uh, their, their, their solutions. Do you think that's simple? It's like swimming upstream. Yes, Salmon can do that. And you know that swimming upstream is dangerous at times <laughs> because your patches might not be accepted. You might be eaten alive, but guess what? They can only eat so many of us. So if we're teaming up, and that's again what OPNFV does, if you go and here is my little patch, dear OpenStack, please accept it. OpenStack might silently ignore and your patch is sitting there for years and not getting merged. But if Open, OPNFV goes there as a community, we can push things through that you alone can't push through. And we've seen that in many occasions. Like the doctor people, initially they tried, NEC tried themselves didn't work out, but having a bunch of companies behind the thing, suddenly they get hurt. Also, the, the fact that we have now an NFV track at OpenStack, a telecoms infrastructure working group and the likes, it's all thanks to, well, OPNFV makes a load of noise. And we have carriers engaged in OPNFV, like AT&T, like Orange, so like NTT. So they have a, a far louder voice if you're not alone. So we create, and we also compose, deploy, test. So we're doing a little bit of creation. We're also doing a little bit of systems integration, which is why most people call OPNAV as a midstream project, because we're doing both. We're still doing a little bit of coding, but not too much. So the idea is to give really rapid feedback to developers. That's what we try to do in OPNAV. What we are not really that much is we are not creating these shiny cars, apparently. So we're composing something, but it's a really, very rough car. If you say, as a customer, I want to go use it to go and do a lab trial of understanding what's coming, go use it. If you want to enter production, please don't. Because the level of testing that we do, yes, we do a fair amount of testing. For product level of qualification, we probably in Cisco do 10x of what we're doing here. Because here a deployment run takes two, three hours, hour and 45 maybe for the deployment, then maybe one hour for testing, that's it. If you get a solution from Cisco, I think you want to have all corner cases tested. All kinds of HA testing that we don't hear, do here, we do internally. Which is why, yeah, we have an NFVI solution. And lots of people say, well, why is your NFVI solution still based on, say, Liberty or Mercury and not on latest Newton like we're building it with, open, uh, with, uh, with fast data stacks right now? Well, that's the reason. It takes time. And that's also the delta of what we're doing here. Here, we're pushing the envelope. And as Cisco, we are learning a lot because loads of things already surface here. Does everything surface in OPNFV? No, it doesn't. And that's what you typically see in open source, right? So the hardening, company specific. And maybe some additional glory features. Base level pushing the envelope, base level development. Well, you do yourself, uh, you, you do as an open community effort. 
And there's also like, there is no single OPNFV. I think we understood that by now. It depends on the composition, there are many. Um, and I can't elevate one over the other. So create, compose, deploy, test, and start over. That's all OPNFV. One thing that I mentioned briefly just a minute ago is we have people not only from a vendor perspective, but we have China Mobile, AT&T, NTT Docomo, Vodafone. So we have a bunch of service providers as part of the community, even at platinum level, so they pay big dollars for being part of that community. Why? They keep us honest. So if you do systems integration, again, we have an OPNFV user group that comes up with recommendations. This is what we like. This is what we want to go see. They come up with requirements. Do we implement all these requirements? Well, code follows interest. And it needs to follow interest both from, yeah, customers asking for it, but there is also resources that are ready to do that. So the vendors need to go and supply these resources. Um, so, but, yeah, it's a good guidance because these people will, will constantly ask us questions and, for instance, especially AT&T and, and um, also Orange, I got to go highlight, they do a lot of code contributions. They drive projects. They develop themselves. That's also what I see as a trajectory, right? There's so, so, lot, so much kind of co-development happening these days between a vendor like Cisco and the open community and maybe even the service provider. So you start to see far more interlock that it's not only I create, you consume, but we create together for the common target. So by the numbers, I think we are growing membership. By now, we have 58 members, um, quite a diversity. We are north of a, a, a 10,000 commits, and we have a relatively healthy community by now of around about 250 people coding, doing testing, whatever, right? So, I think that's all signs of a healthy community. So it's not a single trick pony from a single vendor. There is nobody dominating OPNFV, but it's one big club of people who are contributing with one common goal, and that common goal is build NFV infrastructure for the industry. Because I can't get differentiation from I run on OpenStack. Right? It's the same thing if this, this, did Cisco ever sell you a router saying, it's built on Linux. No, right? It's like table stakes. You need an operating environment, but that's it. So let's look at one example, and that's the one example that we're also showing at that, uh, the DevNet area here. That's a project that we started off shortly after Cisco open sourced the fast forwarder, so the vector packet processor, where we said, let's go and create a stack that is really fast and can go far, much faster than what the industry currently has and integrate OpenStack with a network controller, Open Daylight, the fast forwarder, and, well, make this overall deployable and tested in an automated way, which is why we had to do it in OPNFE. So systems integration, install. We use an installer from, from Red Hat based on Triple O. And testing, that happened in OPNFE. But we had to do a bunch of enhancements in FIDO, so in order to give it the right capability set. So for instance, we had to go and create new capability to create VXLAN tunnels. And in Open Daylight, we had to go and create a piece of infrastructure to make group-based policy be able to talk to this new forwarder. So far, this thing, yeah, well, it was able to talk to OVSs, but it wasn't able to speak the language, which is NetConf Yang here, like, pretty much like a standard router, um, to speak the language down and be able to configure these instances. So we had to go and create this code in open daylight. So we had to swim upstream here, we had to swim upstream here in order to integrate these components. And well, the first incarnation came out in, in uh, September release, so in the Colorado release. And since then, we've been evolving the thing. So initially, we started with layer two. By now, we have layer three capability in the works. And um, there is also a direct integration between OpenStack and VPP. So if you are not interested in anything topology, but you're just plumbing into a VLAN, you can use a native ML2 plugin that plugs directly between OpenStack and um, the uh, VPP fast forwarding infrastructure. And what we're showcasing here is we have a full stack deployment. 
And that full stack deployment is two compute instances, a single controller. And we're using a tool I mentioned before, NFV Bench, to pump traffic into that system and see what the black box performance of this system will be um, if we're just trending traffic into that system and receiving it back. And um, well, one stream that we can configure, and that's what is running under test there, is you just pump traffic in at layer two and receive it back, or you can also send it across a magnitude of, of uh, different compute instances to just see what the car behaves if you look at it from a pure user perspective. And um, what we find is, and you can see that kind of the bars moving in real time, this is what we test in real time. And um, the results that show up here is roughly, you see in the area of 2.3 million packets per second with no drop rate. So if I define no drop rate as less than 0. Uh, 001%, then, well, I'm ending up with roughly 2.3 million packets a second that I could push through the system um, with no packet losses. If you compare the same thing to a setup, and we have cache data there from an OVS setup, it's roughly at 57 kilo thousand packets per second. So we're talking almost two orders of magnitude between the two. So that's what we had before September. This is what we have since September. And that's really an NFV stack is only as good as kind of the engine, right? So it's like with any car. You can have the most shiny car. If you don't put an engine in that is appropriate, it's not going to really move. What we're testing here, and you see that live, is we're starting off with what's the max capacity that I can really send from an interface perspective. And then it's adjusting the send rate to the level where you see that the send rate and the receive rate are in the range where you have the loss minimized. And then I have this kind of non-drop rate detected, right? So it's adjusting the send rate to the receive rate until these two uh, curves match. And then I can measure these, uh, these drop rates. So if you want to go see the live demo, just see us across. It's right across. And that's pretty much it, right? What's next? It's pretty much evolving of what we have. More capability set. We're working on a solution that's using Open Daylight at layer three mode, completely replacing anything Linux kernel networking from OpenStack to really go fast, not only inside a tenant network, but also going outside. We're working on a solution that is natively pure IPv6 so that you can replace v4 entirely off the map. Some people at large service providers in the US, like Comcast, have a clear desire to go there. Um, we will enhance testing with more capabilities in HA testing so that we can really be sure that the system under stress is always working. Um, so expect more of the same. And um, want to go do a little bit of advertising for OPNFE. Um, if you fancy a trip to Beijing in June, come and see us. That's it. Create, compose, deploy, test, and start over and over and over. Systems integration as a community effort. Come and join us. It's all open. It's all free. There is no cost involved as a developer to use anything in OPNFE. So joining is free if you want to go there as an individual contributor. If you want to have your logo up, you need to pay. But do you really want your logo up? Probably not. Thank you so much.